but around one in 30 women under 40 have an earlier menopause. So women in their 20s and 30s can still have menopausal symptoms. I had no idea what was happening to me despite being a menopause specialist because I thought the symptoms were just due to my job being really difficult, having three children, having a busy life. One in 10 women end up leaving their job due to menopausal symptoms. I would absolutely not be working as a doctor if I wasn't taking HRT. And, you know, that's quite scary. It's horrible when your brain is not working properly. I go and see my doctor and they say, no, you can't have HRT. You're too young, you're too old, you're too whatever. And you think, oh, this is this real struggle for women to be listened to. That's the, that's the real problem. Dr. Louise Newson, a trailblazer in women's health and a leading authority on menopause management. As a GP and a menopause specialist, Dr. Newson has revolutionized the conversation around menopause, advocating for better understanding and treatment. Join us as Dr. Newson demystifies menopause, shares expert advice, and champions a proactive approach to women's wellness. What is the connection between sex and menopause? Lack of sex and menopause, I think you should probably ask. Women just sit there and say, no, I haven't had sex for years. So even if you, you know, try and have sex, a lot of women are saying it's so painful and uncomfortable. And that's hard for the woman, but it's also hard for the partner as well. But if men were experiencing these symptoms, and if you do have sex, it's going to be really painful and your penis will dry up and be uncomfortable. The Avenue of the Strongest is a podcast dedicated to exploring the lives and experiences of the most inspiring individuals from around the world. Each episode features interviews with fascinating guests who share their insights and wisdom on a variety of topics, including education, impact, motivation, health, and learning. Here are your hosts, Aniette Chowdhury and Vlad Suleiman. Over the last year, 86.6% of our regular viewers have not yet hit the subscription button. Your subscription means a lot to us. It's a small gesture on your end and a huge leap forward for our channel. If you wouldn't mind, we would love to ask you if you found our channel informative and engaging, if you can please hit that subscription button. Your subscription means a lot to us. It allows us to go ahead and continue to put out great content, better guests, and as always, we will always put out two episodes per week. Thank you so much. Dr. Newson, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. Oh, thank you for inviting me. It's great. Absolutely. I kind of wanted to start the conversation first by talking about menopause, but specifically to the audience of men. What do you wish more men <laughs> specifically understood about menopause? And I want to take this time because, you know, it's, it's I think it's a great uh, starting point over here because I know there's a lot of uh, female listeners, obviously it pertains to them, but I'm really interested into your thoughts of what men or the par partners, significant others should really be aware. What do you wish they understood about menopause? Yeah, isn't it important? I can't think of anything else in life that is guaranteed to affect 51% of the population directly and 49% indirectly. I can't think of a man that doesn't know a woman who's going to be menopausal. So it's crucial that understanding is, is really good it's not just let's see what the word means let's just not do a little nod to it we have to really know exactly what it is but not just men women children anyone because it has such a massive impact so looking at what it is in that it happens when our hormone levels decline and it's just three they're sex hormones but they don't define our sex or our gender because men and women have the three hormones estradiol progesterone testosterone but those hormones are produced in all sorts of areas of our body but especially our ovaries so when the levels decline this is what causes the menopause. So it's not just about periods stopping. And I don't really care about whether my periods have stopped or not. I care about my body and my brain functioning and being healthy. So we have to think about these hormones being chemical messengers that go into our bloodstream, affect every single cell in our body. And once we know that, then often people can then think, well, what do they do? What's the importance of the hormones? Why are they affecting every cell in our body? 
And then we know when the hormone levels reduce, um, that's when symptoms can occur. But it's not just flushes and sweats. There's a myriad of, of symptoms, but mainly symptoms affecting our brain function. So low mood, anxiety, irritability, fatigue, poor sleep, memory problems, even personality changes, coordination problems can happen. Um, and that's really important because if you know someone who's having these changes, it's not all in our minds. It's not just something that we're a bit stressed and we can't cope with our job or our home circumstances. Um, but then there are obviously other symptoms. So um, symptoms such as palpitations, headaches, muscle and joint pains, a lot of bowel symptoms. So people can have um, bloating or nausea or indigestion, which can be related to hormones. So, um, and also urinary symptoms can be very common as well. Um, so lots and lots of symptoms can occur. But whether a woman has symptoms or not, because the hormones are so important and anti-inflammatory in our body, there's an increased risk of diseases. And for me as a physician, that's the most important part, actually, because we know it's great women are living longer, but we're more likely to have inflammatory diseases such as heart disease, mm. osteoporosis, diabetes, depre uh, de clinical depression and dementia. So that's why it's crucial that we understand that it's not just a few symptoms we'll get over because we've got evidence based treatment, which we can talk about, but it's, it's recognizing it. And for decades, even centuries, it's not been recognized. You know, I see a lot of women in my clinic who have been diagnosed with chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, uh, some, uh, arthritis, migraines, recurrent urinary tract infections. No one's thought about their hormones. Hmm. And that's stemming from menopause, right? Yeah. And and it's and even before people become officially menopausal, officially, you have to be a year since your last period. But a lot of women have symptoms before their periods stop. And um so that's what we call the perimenopause. So most women it happens the menopause in the early fifties. But the perimenopause can last for 10 years or so. So that means women in their 40s. But around one in 30 women under 40 have an earlier menopause. So women in their 20s and 30s can still have menopausal symptoms. So we don't need wow. to be thinking, oh, we'll wait till we're older before we know about it. Hmm. I, you know, it's very interesting. I And I know that you put out a recent stat, well, not you, but there's a stat here, which I thought was shocking. And I don't know, Vlad, if you're familiar with this. I sure wasn't. Uh, but and I'm not sure if it's uh, nationwide or if it's UK, uh, if, if it's country specific. But one in ten women end up leaving their job due to menopausal symptoms. Uh, that that was that's that's pretty shocking. And yeah, the the thing that bothers me is that there's so much more education that needs to be done mm. on this topic because, as you've mentioned, for for centuries and centuries, it's just okay. This is something that every woman goes through, and mm. these are just symptoms get over it correct yeah yeah and it is a real worry so yeah we've done different surveys um and it consistently showing around one in ten women are giving up their jobs but we did a survey not so long ago of just women who work in the nhs so not just doctors but women who are working okay. in our national health service which employs by the way 40 percent of their employees are menopausal women and um, 37 percent of them were considering reducing their hours but couldn't afford to now if I'm going to a job and want to reduce my hours, you can't tell me I'm doing the best of my ability at my job. A lot of women are wanting right. to go part time. A lot of women aren't going for promotion. So they're not reaching their potential as um, you know, in their job, but also they're probably their earning potential is less as well. So when we look about the economic problems of the menopause, you know, that's huge. Right. Not only are these women often having time off work, so they're not getting their salary or they're reducing their hours. There's a lot of women who are going off with sickness. And I worked many years ago now with the West Midlands um, police, and we found that the commonest symptoms affecting people in the workplace are anxiety, memory problems and fatigue. So there's lots of organizations that will go in and talk about, let's look at your temperature control in your workplace. Let's think about your uniform. I mean, how patronizing is that? If my brain doesn't work, I don't care about the temperature of the clothing. Right. Um, and right. that is a real problem. And it's very scary. I mean, I would 
absolutely not be working as a doctor if I wasn't taking HRT. And, you know, mm. that's quite scary. It's horrible when your brain is not working properly. This podcast is sponsored by Argo Prep, an award-winning educational publisher serving over a million students nationwide. If you're a kindergarten to eighth grade teacher or principal, be sure to check out our supplementary workbooks to get your students ready for standardized state testing. We cover all subjects from kindergarten to eighth grade. Use the coupon code AVENUE for a 25% discount off of all purchase orders. Visit us today at argoprep.com slash store. I have another statistics over here that's saying 85% of women who are complaining of having the menopause or menopausal symptoms, they are not going for the treatment. And actually, it's only 10.5% going and receiving treatment. What about everybody else? It's less what, than what? that, actually. Less. Yeah, so globally, it's about globally wow. it's about 5% of women receive treatment. And why is that? Why? Well, it's in the UK, it's about 14, 15%. In the US, it's about 4% of menopausal women. And that's because of many things. Most of it is due to unfounded fears about treatment. And the treatment we give is replacing the missing hormones, because I've already said it's a hormone deficiency. But we now have the hormones that are biochemically exactly the same as the hormones we produce as women when we're younger. But what's happened 20 odd years ago there was a study that showed there was possibly an increased risk of breast cancer with some types of hrt mm -hmm. but it was a synthetic type of hormone so the estrogen was actually derived from pregnant horses urine which we don't use now and the progesterone okay. was a synthetic so chemically altered progesterone so metabolically very different in, in our bodies even that study didn't show that they were, it was increased by a statistically significant amount. But it's just this hangover from that. People are now worried and doctors are worried. Doctors don't have training. And then um, people then just see it as a sort of natural aging process. But there are lots of things that increase in incidence as we age, such as cardiovascular disease or um, hypertension. But I wouldn't watch someone's blood pressure go up as a doctor and not treat it. So that's right, where exactly. there's this misinformation and also this misunderstanding that it's it's just a few symptoms we'll get through. Um, and lots of women think, well, actually it's not as bad as my friends, so I just won't worry about it. Mm. Or people think you have to have a certain number of symptoms or you have to have flushes or sweats, otherwise you're not menopausal. Now I never had a hot flush, or I had one actually. But I had months of symptoms, I had no idea what was happening to me, despite being a menopause specialist, because I thought the symptoms were just due to my job being really difficult, having three children and having a busy life. So it's it's sometimes quite difficult to join the dots and realise as a woman that, mm, yes, your hormones are changing. And that's where the question you asked at the beginning it's so important that men and others know, because if my husband, who I love him dearly as a doctor, if he had recognised my symptoms a bit earlier as being related to hormonal changes, I wouldn't have had such a concern that I was going to have to give up my job. So, you know, it, mm. it, often you notice changes in others more than you notice yourself because you're with yourself, aren't you, 24-7. So sometimes subtle changes you don't always notice. So this is this is great. I want can we? I, I want to go ahead and uncover a little bit uh, and talk more about HRT. So that's that's what mm. what we're getting at. And actually, that's a staggering. You said you mentioned only four four percent or less than four uh, percent in, mm. in the United States, right? Mm. So uh, let's let's talk about HRT. So w what exactly is it? Let's get, let's get down to the found, uh, to the, to the basics here. So we're we're tr the whole goal is to get back to the to regular regular hormonal levels for each for estrogen testosterone and progesterone did i get that correct or is is that is that not correct yeah so if i said to you you've got iron deficiency probably the next question you would ask me as a clinician is oh goodness why well how did i get it and how can i get some iron and what dose do i need so it's no different right. for the menopause it's a hormone deficiency of either or or maybe all estrogen progesterone testosterone and we often work out according to symptoms um, we sometimes do blood tests to guide us they don't diagnose because our hormone levels can change and all we do is 
replace what's missing. So in the perimenopause, we might give a low dose to top up the decline. And when people are menopausal, we often increase the dose and give slightly more. But because we know what the hormones are and we know we can get them, it's just matching like with like. So it's not even a chemical. Okay. It's not even a drug that we're giving. It's just the natural hormones, um, which is really ironic because you know, it's not difficult medicine, but as we've already said, the difficulty is firstly women being diagnosed because they're often not believed. They they think it's, you know, people think it's all in our heads. We're not having the, the typical flushes or sweats. And then when it is diagnosed, there's quite a lot of pushback and people say, oh, no, you don't want HRT. Let's try and give you some painkillers for your joint pain or let's try and give you some sleeping tablets because you don't sleep or let's give you some antidepressants for your low mood. And this is just sticking plasters on it. It's not treating the underlying cause. Um, but there's lots of misinformation. There's lots of poor education for a lot of healthcare professionals globally and then there is a bit of corruption with pharmaceutical companies quite enjoying the fact that women are taking four or five different medications for all their different symptoms. Because we know from the research that when women take HRT, they feel better. Great. So they don't have symptoms if you get the dose and type right. But more importantly, when women take HRT, they have less inflammation in their body. So they have less risk of heart disease, osteoporosis, diabetes, de dementia. And a lot of people who come to our clinic, we are de-prescribing. So once they're well on HRT, mm. they can come off their antidepressant and their painkillers and their sleeping tablets and so forth. So for that individual, it's great. And actually for healthcare systems, it's great because these women aren't going back and forth to the hospital for various tests and drugs. But actually for pharmaceutical companies who make these drugs, it's not ideal, is it? So this is this is very interesting. So while you're talking about this, I have a so I have something specific that I would like to ask you. So as a clinician, and not you because I know what you do, but let's just say a 50 year old female patient mm. comes in and starts talking about uh, these symptoms. Are GPs in general saying, hey, well, let's go ahead and uh, measure your hormone levels for estrogen and progesterone and testosterone? I, I, is, it, is it a lack of uh, education on the GPs end in general? So I'm, I'm trying to understand mm. uh, the disconnect here. So for you, mm. right, if, if, if a patient comes in, you're saying, okay, well, let's check these levels. And you may or may not recommend HRT, right? That's It's an individual yeah. level basis based on results. But What's going on with uh, uh, with all the other GPs? Yeah, so we don't always measure levels for a diagnosis because, and I'll explain why, because it's important to know, because I don't want people to think you can have a blood test and it be diagnosed. In the perimenopause, okay. when our hormone levels are changing, they can fluctuate quite a lot. So when I was perimenopausal, for example, I might, might have felt fine at two in the afternoon, gone for a blood test and my levels would have been mm. normal. At two in the morning, okay. when I'm waking up with crippling anxiety, my hormone levels would be low so you can be falsely reassured okay. and then the other thing is you could have a test that shows low estrogen but you could also have low iron that's making you feel tired for example and you've not had that iron blood test so it's very important that you're assessed properly but what happens mm. is often is that people go to their doctor or clinician with one or two symptoms and the doctor is only focusing on those one or two symptoms so you know, I get migraines, for example, my headaches and migraines were a lot worse when when I was perimenopausal. If I had just spoken to my doctor about that, they would have given me drugs for my migraines, but wouldn't have thought, hmm, she's 45. Let me think what else is going on. Are you having any muscle joint pains? Are you having any mood changes? What's your sleep like? Um, are you having any urinary symptoms? Oh, right. Yes. OK. What's your periods doing? Could you be perimenopausal? And that's what's happening. And medicine's very siloed. So, you know, I was teaching some rheumatologists in London a couple of weeks ago and they've never prescribed HRT. But they all tell mm. me they see women in their 40s with muscle and joint pains who have normal investigations for rheumatological disorders. And then they discharge them because they don't know what else to do with them. 
but it was just mm. that light bulb moment. They suddenly thought, went, oh, I had no idea you could get muscle and joint pains with perimenopause or menopause. And I didn't know HRT was so safe. So if you're not taught it, you don't know. And then you try and put it down to other things. And and a lot of my work is education, but not just education, educating the healthcare professionals, educating women so that they can then go, look, I'm getting this symptom, that symptom, and the other symptom, I think it's due to my changing hormone levels. Could I have a trial of hormones and see? And that's mm. often in medicine, we often do this thing called a therapeutic trial, which basically means we try a medicine and see if it helps. So like if you came to me and right. said, I've got a sore thumb, I would say, well, I'll give you this painkiller, but if the, this one doesn't work, right. there's another one I could try. And that's exactly the same. You know, if someone's got palpitations and they're also feeling low in their mood and they might be having some other symptoms, I'll say, well, your palpitations might be due to your hormones. Maybe you might have a heart problem, but let's give you some hormones and see. And if your palpitations carry on, I'll refer you to a cardiologist. But if they go straight to a cardiologist who hasn't been trained in the menopause, they only focus on that one symptom. And that's what happens in medicine, that you're very siloed with each organ, if you see what I mean. And then no one's mm -hmm. joining the pieces. So that's why education of, like your first question, men, but also women is, is crucially important so they can help the clinician. But what is happening is women are more aware and I get so many messages on my social media every day saying, I've been really empowered. I've listened to your Instagram live. I've listened to your podcast. I know what's wrong with me. Finally, I go and see my doctor and they say, no, you can't have HRT. You're too young. You're too old. You're too whatever. Mm. And you think, oh, this is this real struggle for women to be listened to. That's the that's the real problem. So if, if they if, if they say hey, we, we're not recommending HRT, that the patient does not have the right to say well i want it anyway well they do but it's hard isn't it right right you're right yes if my doctor told me something i'm not going to go against their wishes and yeah. say hey you know i know better than you i listen to a podcast mm. and you yeah, know, exactly. know at all. yeah certainly not yeah okay i get that what, what about the what about the age when women supposed to go and start testing if they have premenopause pre uh yeah, well, they don't need to test. That's what I'm saying. So um, one of the reasons that I created the Balance app, which is a free app for anybody to um, download, is so that people can monitor symptoms. And then if people monitor their symptoms, usually we suggest every three months, then you can have a little reflection and think, right, I've got these symptom changes and nothing else has changed in my life. So what is it going on? Could it be related to my hormones? And I know we talk a lot about whether periods are changing, but a lot of women don't have periods for various reasons. So that's why it's really important to look at all the symptoms. And then sometimes, you know, I don't know whether symptoms are due to hormones or not, but I'll often say try HRT because it's very safe. It's very low dose. Try for three months. If you start to feel better, then we know that some or all of your symptoms are related. And then when people are on hormones, we do sometimes or quite often do blood tests then to see if their hormones are being, um, the, the HRT is being absorbed into their body so we can fine tune and make sure they're on the right dose and type. Because some women, about a third of women who come to our clinic are already taking hormones. And then they say, oh, I'm no better, so it can't be my hormones. And you say, well, no, actually, you're not on the right dose or type um, because of you know, the combination of estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, and different women need different doses. Are there any risks that uh, come with HRT? No. And it, what's interesting is lots of people think there are because of this, the hangover from this older types. So um, we usually give the estrogen through the skin and the testosterone through the skin as a, as a, as a patch or a gel, um, or there's a spray, and then it goes straight into the bloodstream. So it bypasses the liver, it doesn't have to be metabolized. There's no risk of clot. Um, because they're the natural hormones, there's never been shown to be a risk of um, breast cancer at all associated with it. And there's far more benefits because of the benefits for reducing risk of diseases as well. Um, so it, it's just so it's the safest thing I've ever prescribed as a wow. physician, uh, but the hardest thing for people to access. Like non-hormonal approaches or is just this one? 
Yeah, so it's not, with anything in medicine, it's not just a take a tablet and off you go. It's looking at the bigger picture. You know, there's an increased risk of diseases that I've said already. Um, um, so we, it's really important to look holistically. It's really important to obviously optimize hormones for those women who want to take HRT. Whether women take HRT or not, we should be looking at our nutrition, our exercise, our mental health, our well-being, right. our sleep. You know, that goes without saying, ex, uh, you know, whether we smoke or drink alcohol, all of that is really important. Now, the non-hormonal treatments, there's little evidence for them. Um, and there's lots of supplements that people can buy. I think it's about $100 billion a year that's spent on all these alternatives. But actually, there's no evidence. But lack of evidence doesn't mean they're not safe. But what I worry about with some of the supplements is people are taking them for individual symptoms. And I've already said there's a myriad of symptoms. So if you're taking something that's only for flushes, for example, how's that going to address your joint pain and your brain fog and your low mood and your poor sleep? Does that mean you take lots of supplements? But also, it's not addressing the long term health risks. So I take HRT to improve my symptoms, of course, because I want to work and function as a person. But I'm really, really worried about osteoporosis, which affects one in two women over the age of 50. I don't want osteoporosis of my spine. So yes, I exercise. Yes, I take vitamin D. Yes, I eat well. But actually, there's an accelerated bone loss when we become menopausal, our bones break down a lot. So it's looking at the, the future benefits. There's a new drug that's come out um, by Estellas, a drug company called Fezolinitin, which is m t targeting just vasomotor symptoms, the flushes and sweats. They've spent about, um, I think it's about $2 billion getting it to market. So they've got a lot of money to make back. So there's a lot of advertising. There's a lot of doctors, especially in the US that are paid by Estellas <laughs> yep. to promote this drug. And and they've recently announced their profits are not as high as predicted. They were hoping to get a lot of money from this drug. So they've predicted three three billion profit rather than seven billion. But they're just it's it's you know, we've looked at the data. It's very not very good studies and they're only focusing on flushes and sweats. So we don't know the long term risks of this new medication that was actually first mm. um when it was first found as a drug it was it was being tested as an antipsychotic medication and it didn't improve mood so they decided to give it to menopausal women because they noticed that flush is reduced so it's it's just we shouldn't be giving women you know you take hrt or not but we shouldn't be forcing women to take these non-hormonal treatments that have little evidence and also little evidence for future health as well can you give a couple examples of not common symptoms of the menopause? Yeah, so one of the symptoms that people always um, don't associate necessarily the menopause with is um, tinnitus, so ringing in the ears can be very, very common. Um, because our physical nerves um, need our hormones to work properly, so our, um, the hormones help build the myelin sheath, which is the, like the conducting part of the, the nerve and helps the processing of any responses from the nerves to our brains. And so the, the ringing in the ears, the tinnitus can be very common. Also, pins and needles can be very common. Some people mm -hmm. get what's called formication, which is like a feeling of insects or spiders crawling over the skin, which you can imagine is oh, horrid. Wow. But that's because the, the yeah. signal going to the brain is is um, not very good. Um, dry eyes can be very common. So people find they can't put contact lenses in. And change of uh, taste and smell can occur as well because the mucous mem membranes get affected. So these are symptoms that you wouldn't necessarily associate with hormonal changes. I had a question. I, 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 I don't know if it's a fair question to ask you, but I'll, a I'll ask it anyway, and you can uh, decide how you want to answer this. But we're talking about a little bit about pharmaceutical companies and how especially they push it in the U.S., which we're well aware of because we are mm. in the United States. But I wanted to ask you, because I have no idea uh, what the situation is like in U.K. So as a GP, how it, 
do pharma companies they're heavily push you know are their sales rep heavily you know going into your clinics and hospitals and pushing it down and saying how is that yeah it's not as big as in the u.s but it is there um a lot of the menopause societies like we've got the british menopause society you've got the north american menopause society there's also the international menopause society all these societies take money from pharmaceutical companies um as an organization i don't take any money from pharmaceutical companies when i developed and opened Newson Health five years ago, um, the board and I made the decision not to do anything with pharma because it's really important for me that my work's very transparent because I work a lot in the public and I want people to really trust me. So I don't have a hidden agenda at all, um, nor do I, you know, endorse any products. You know, you can buy menopause shampoos and face cream, which are complete right. waste okay. of money. So, um, so there is that, unfortunately. So there are a lot of menopause specialists that are, are are paid or paid some money by pharmaceutical companies for education or for doing work. Um, so that, there is that that goes on. Okay, let's move to the uh, to my next question. So I've been doing a lot of research and I saw that uh, actually 85% of women going through menopause are lacking in vitamin D. And for those who don't know, this is a nutrition crucial for bone health, mood regulation and immune function. So of course, it's no wonder why so many women experience uh, hot flashes, fatigue, bone, uh, bone loss during the, this transition. So my question to you is, is it simply that they are supposed to take the vitamin D as a supplement or there is more into it? Well, everybody should take vitamin D. So vitamin D, as you, as you know, is a vitamin as well as a hormone. Um, if you look at people in hospital, it's nearly 100% of people in hospital have low vitamin D. Wow. Um, so it can be associated with increased inflammation. So it's, um, it's just an independent hormone and lots of people especially over the winter months don't get adequate vitamin d because you have to get it from the sunlight so the more you test vitamin d the more you will find it low and so it's really important that you know men women children have vitamin d supplements because like you quite rightly say it's very good for our bone health but it's also good for our immune function too so a lot of women have low vitamin d but replacing vitamin D is is really important, but it won't improve menopausal symptoms that are related to, you know, other hormones mm. being low. The same with iron. You know, we mentioned earlier about iron deficiency. A lot of women are iron deficient. Sometimes it's because they've had heavy periods because people's periods can become more heavy before they become menopausal. But actually, estrogen, estradiol, and testosterone can really affect iron absorption. So if we have low um, hormones that will actually reduce the ability for us to absorb iron from our gut uh, and from our diet. So often we find um, low iron too. And that's why I, I was saying before, it's really important that people have holistic care. You don't want someone that's only focusing on hormones and saying, right, we'll give you hormones and then you'll feel amazing. You know, I obviously take HRT, but if I you know, drank whiskey for breakfast and smoked 20 a day, I wouldn't be as healthy as I am, you know, right. so it's it's really important and making sure we don't sort of blame every symptom onto the menopause because, you know, I'm trained as a general physician. So I'm constantly, every patient I see, I'm thinking, what else could be going on? Is there something else, you know, that's causing these symptoms? And um, people can have two or three different things going on, of course, at the same time. I have a very quick question for you, um, because just because we were talking about vitamin D and you mentioned that everybody in general should be taking a vitamin D supplement. So this is out of the scope of uh, menopause. Um, just just in general, as a GP, assuming that you know we're not running a blood test to s actually see, w are there general things that you recommend that everybody generally take, such as vitamin D? Anything else on that list? No, I think when you look at sort of supplements, it's looking in a very individual way, to be honest. Okay. Um, so okay. vitamin D, yes. Um, I think most things we should really be trying to get from our food. That's really important. So looking at our nutrition is crucially important. And there are certain supplements, for example, I have migraine and magnesium, some types of magnesium can help reduce migraine frequency so i would for some patients recommend a good quality magnesium supplement but that's on an individual rather than right. your menopausal therefore you must take xyz you see what I mean? got it spoke okay. about the diet uh i heard that the mediterranean diet is very good 
in in this case in premenopause and menopause because it it is rich with the estrogen right not really i mean there are phytoestrogens in some diets um so you know pro products um can increase but not a huge amount you can't eat your way out of the menopause so you can increase mm -hmm. estrogen a small amount you know there's always a debate about certain countries um certain asian populations seem to have less hot flushes and is it related to their nutrition but if you look in singapore for example they have less hot flushes but they have more uh, joint pains and mental health symptoms often but they also have a really high incidence of osteoporosis and that's why mm. we need to be thinking beyond the symptoms as well. What about the fasting? Does it help? Yeah, it can be good for some people. I mean, intermittent fasting especially can be useful, but it can be useful for men and women as well. So there's no sort of special menopause diet that we should be on. You know, I think it's looking at our future health. The menopause is a cardiometabolic problem, so it will increase incidence of um, type 2 diabetes and cardiac disease but actually if we rebalance our hormones that reduce reduces anyway what i feel really sad about is women are being told you have to have this diet you have to have this exercise but you can't have hormones and it's really mm. difficult to um, change these metabolic processes you can reduce them um, and actually you know taking hrt will help but you need to still be thinking about your nutrition mm. I I saw you you did a podcast recently with Alex Newman, a substance misuse therapist, and so again, very fascinating. I so on the surface level, my question to you is: Is there an increased substance misuse? Uh, is it a relationship between menopause and increase uh, uh, increased substance misuse? I can't answer that easily because no proper research has been done in that area. Okay, but right. Very, very likely, yes. I speak to a lot of women in the clinic who are telling me that they're drinking more alcohol to try and numb their symptoms. Um, mm. They also, um, the, the survey that we did a few months ago in October was asking people about alcohol but also drugs. And increasingly, women have been turning to drugs to try and escape from their symptoms, especially the mental health health symptoms because a lot of women have crippling anxiety they have a real fear one lady wrote about her cage of doom that she felt trapped in and she started to take some um, class a drugs which she'd never done before and wow. she said it was wonderful yeah. to escape the demons in her head but she realized it wasn't a long-term solution um, right. but it's a real concern but you also know the changes that occur because these hormones and neurotransmitters um, you have less dopamine and dopamine is our reward hormone in our brain um, and so often as you, I'm sure you know when people abuse drugs you get this dopamine hit if you can't get this dopamine hit you're going to try other things as well and so some people who've had drug problems in the past they actually go back to drugs um, and it's a real concern. The other thing when we're thinking about drugs is that we know that if people do have a drug addiction, then they're more likely to have an earlier menopause. So I've spoken and seen a lot of women from low socioeconomic classes um, who mm. have had, or you know, they still have, you know, they're abusing heroin, their periods have stopped, they're getting all these mental health symptoms, yet they think it's because of their drug abuse or because their previous trauma that they've had in their life. But they're, the body is very good at protecting ourselves from pregnancy. So if we're abusing our body with drugs or alcohol um, or poor nutrition, we're likely to have an earlier menopause. And we know that as a fact. But a lot of these women, are, there's a lot of medical gaslighting going on. You know, they're being blamed for their abuse rather than thinking what else could be contributing to their symptoms hmm. i have a question um what is the connection between sex and menopause lack of sex at menopause i think you should probably lack of ask. Sex. <laughs> yeah. yeah so you know i'm very open as a doctor i'm not embarrassed talking about anything and um, we do ask patients who come to their clinic um, about libido and reduced libido and i was quite horrified eight years ago when i started my clinic when women just sit there and say, no, I haven't had sex for years. I still love my husband or partner. I don't want him or her to leave me, but I have no desire at all. And the number of women who say, I just 
you know, go to bed early. I close my eyes and just hope I'm asleep before he comes up when he switches the television off mm. or I feign a headache or whatever. And there's lots of reasons why it can happen because, you know, as a perimenopausal or menopausal woman, you might have put on weight, you might have muscle and joint pains, you might have low motivation, feelings of low self-worth. The last thing you want to do is strip off in front of your partner and make yourself feel really, um, you know, sexually active. But then the other symptom that's very, very common is vaginal dryness and soreness. So even if you, you know, try and have sex, a lot of women are saying it's so painful and uncomfortable. And that's hard for the woman, but it's also hard for the partner as well. Or, you know, if every time you have sex, you're going to have a urinary tract infection, it's not going to be very conducive to a good sex life. So it's really hard for the partners as well. You know, the two things that's really hard to talk about to others is sex and and, and money as well, isn't it? So yeah. you, you don't go to out for, for a drink with your mates as a man or a woman to say, do you know what, guys, I'm having zero sex and it's really affecting me. Um, and it does, you know, relationships do fall apart. And a lot of uh, partners that I speak to say, I just thought it was me. I thought she didn't love me anymore. I thought it was something that mm. I was doing wrong, but actually didn't realize that actually these women, it's all related. And symptoms of vaginal dryness affect about 70 to 80 percent of menopausal women, yet only wow. about seven or eight percent of women have treatment. And we often give vaginal hormones. So it's like a pessary or a cream that is inserted vaginally which can help the vaginal dryness, but also the urinary symptoms as well. So whether a woman takes HRT or not, she can still use vaginal hormones. So even women who have had breast cancer and told that HRT can't be first line treatment, they can still use vaginal hormones. And, and those symptoms aren't just due to sex being painful. A lot of women I see, they find it hard to sit down. They find it hard to wear underclothes because mm. they get such soreness. Um, yet we know from studies you know less than half of women actually go and see a doctor and if they do they're often not given treatment because the doctors haven't had the right training which is just awful see this is when it comes to education men as well because if you're yes. a woman having yes. all the right. symptoms and you are just looking at it knowing nothing about it at least if you would yeah. listen to our podcast at least you would recognize and you would speak you know with with your uh, second half and you know do some tests and so on and I think a lot of women are also, also afraid just to speak and talk and tell why are they doing it? Why do they behave it like that? Yeah, and I think there's also this stigma that, you know, maybe your mother or your auntie or your grandmother has just got, got on with it. And people still talk about this transition, like we sort of go through the menopause. But actually, right. whether we have symptoms or not, we're always going to be menopausal. It lasts forever. It doesn't right. stop at a certain time. Um, and so we shouldn't be just thinking, oh, I'll just wait a bit longer and see if my symptoms improve. Because they might or might not improve, but your body is changing and having increased inflammation. And that's what's really important. One last question to you. Uh, what advice do you have for women who are just starting their menopause journey? So download Balance, the free app. Read as much information that's evidence-based and unbiased. And just work out, especially if you're early, think about what, what treatment or treatments is right for you. And you can change your mind at any time. You can try something, you don't have to continue, or you might decide not to have something or try it at a different, different stage, but involve other people as well. I think that's crucially important too. Um, and no one should be blaming themselves for the symptoms that they have. I've heard people say, look, you get more exercises, you get, sorry, you get more symptoms if you don't exercise or you eat a certain food or don't mm -hmm. eat a certain food. And then it's setting women up to fail. You know, it's really quite hard being a woman. I don't want to be here for sympathy, but if men were experiencing these symptoms, you know, if I said to a man, you're guaranteed to have something that's going to affect your mental state, probably affect your memory. 10% of you will give up your job. You won't feel like having sex. And if you do have sex, it's going to be really painful and your penis will dry up and be uncomfortable. I've got treatment, but I'm only going to give it to one in 20 of you. Do you think that's okay? Mm. 
you know, it just wouldn't happen. But, you know, it's right. just like put up and shut up and we shouldn't. And certainly younger generations of people, I've got three daughters, you know, they really kick ass. They are not going to suffer like we've suffered. And it, we shouldn't have to. We don't get a medal for suffering. And I think that's really important. I love that comment that you made about the younger generation. Mm. That is true. The younger generation does not put up with that. And um, I, I think we're in an era of education and, 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 and being educated, but also being vocal and trying to communicate, whether it's with your partners or physicians or whoever it is in general. Uh, back in the day, or you know, maybe our generation or your generation, we're just so used to the traditional norms, which is, you know, this is what happens. And I wanted to say to your comment about the uh, the education and speaking out. Already what we are doing here, two men speaking about the menopause. I mean, this is speaking out. So men, please be educated about this topic. Yeah, well, if even one person can leave here just slightly more educated, that would be fantastic. That's that would be great. Now, uh, Dr. Newson, it's been an absolute pleasure getting to speak with you, getting to learn more about this topic, getting to learn more about this issue. It certainly is an issue. Uh, can you please share with our audience uh, where they can find you? Anything interesting that you have going on? Uh, please let our audience know. Yeah, well, my, my website is drlouisenewson.co.uk, so it's very easy to find. And there's lots on there talking about, um, obviously, Balance app, um, balance-menopause.com website, which has over 3,000 resources on it for people, and my weekly podcast as well. Um, lots of information. And, you know, I'm very active on social media, especially my Instagram. So lots of people find great information that way too. Um, so yes, explore what I'm doing. I'm trying to reach as many people as possible to get the education and knowledge that they need and deserve to make the right choices for them. Dr. Newson, thank you so much for all that you do. Keep up the amazing thank work. You. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure.